So the title of uh, today's talk is in two parts. A crack in everything, like shining through a wall, and the two parts are inspired or linked in my mind with uh, two different characters. If we start with the subtitle, like shining through a wall, for people of a certain generation who are TV viewers, it's linked with this character who some of you in the audience might remember, many of you perhaps not. This is Jamie, and he had a magic torch. And his magic torch, when he pointed it at a wall, would allow the beam of light to go through the wall. And not only could the light go through the wall, but Jamie could follow on. Well, it's not quite, not quite as, um, not quite an exact copy of what I'm going to talk about today, but nevertheless, it's fairly close. Certainly, um, we are going to talk about how to take a beam of light and pass it through something that we would consider to be solid. Initially, something that might sound to be a little bit crazy, but I'm going to try and convince you that this is possible, possibly. And the possibility <laughs> is if there was a crack, a crack through which the light could go, a crack in everything. Now, this is linked with quite a different character. It's a song lyric. I don't know if anybody knows the song from which it comes. It's Leonard Cohen, Anthem. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Okay. And we can take that in two ways, both relevant to this talk, possibly neither of which were meant by Mr. Cohen, but I will, I will reattribute his words. Firstly, that it's when theories in science aren't perfect that they're at the most interesting, and that if they all were perfect and we understood the universe around us perfectly, then there would be no point in what we do. And I'm going to point to one such crack where we don't understand. And secondly, quite literally, I'm hoping I'm going to persuade you that there's the possibility that nature has chosen to create a crack a crack in ordinary matter that might genuinely allow light to come through. Okay, so this is a talk about light and dark, and I wanted to start by just reminding us of, of the light part, the bit that we see. So if we were to go out and look into the, the sky during the day here in Lancaster, other than clouds, we might have the lucky uh, fortune to see the sun, and the sun is about 150 million kilometres away from us, and it's easy to forget that it's a rather a long way. It takes light about eight minutes to travel from the sun's surface to reach us on Earth. So when we look at the sun, we're seeing an image eight minutes old. And at night, again, if we're lucky enough that it's cloudless, we might get a glimpse of the stars. And our nearest star in the constellation of Centaurus, Proxima Centauri, and the light from there has been travelling four years, just over four years, to reach us. In the Milky Way, well, our own galaxy, if we look towards the centre, the light from the very centre of the Milky Way has been travelling for 27,000 years. And our nearest galaxy, or at least our nearest large galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, that's 170,000 years that light's been travelling from that galaxy before it reaches us here on Earth. And if we look at the light coming from the furthest distances that we can possibly detect, we're looking at something of the order of 10 billion years that the light's been travelling to reach us. And there is the Large Magellanic Cloud as pictured by Hubble. So the visible part of our universe is, is fantastic and glorious and worthy of much study in its own right. It's worth just taking away two more things from this slide. The first thing is that, based on what I've just said, when we look up into the night sky, what we're seeing is very much a montage a juxtaposition of light that's been travelling towards us for very vastly different times. Not a true representation of the universe as it is now, but essentially a collage, a montage of light taken from completely different parts of the universe's history and put together just because they happen to be coincident on us at a given time. Which is rather a, a beautiful thought, I think. And the second thing to bear in mind is that when a physicist talks about light, they're not just talking about the visible light that our eyes, our human eyes, happen to be sensitive to. We include in that all light, light that our eyes are not sensitive to. So if we go down to longer wavelengths than the visible light that our eyes can perceive, infrared through microwaves and radio waves, and if we go the other way, 
up through all the colours of the rainbow and through violet, and then we go into ultraviolet and off into X rays and gamma rays. All parts of light. Parts of light that we can't personally perceive with our own perceptions, but we can build instruments that allow us to do it. So it's all accessible to us. So all of that would count as light. And one of the most baffling things, interesting things, one of the cracks in our theories of everything stands today is the fact that despite all that we can see and all the ways we can extend our senses using these instruments to perceive wavelengths that wouldn't have been accessible to us only a short time ago in human history, it's not enough. It isn't enough because when we look up into the night sky and we make precision measurements of what we see, the motions of the stars within a galaxy, the motions of galaxies and galactic clusters, lead us to believe that all the visible matter, if all summed together, simply isn't sufficient to explain the motion that we see. We think we understand the rules of gravity. We think we understand how matter should move in gravitational fields. We've got very good tests of it here in our local environment. And yet, when we apply those same rules to these other structures that we can see with our telescopes, we suddenly find that what we're seeing doesn't add up. The predictions don't meet. So that you can do things like take what's called rotational curves, where you look at how stars are traveling within a galaxy around the galactic center, and you know how fast the things are moving, and you know how much mass you think is in the galaxy, and yet somehow these things don't balance out. So you've got only two ways out of this problem. Either we don't understand gravity in the way that we thought we did, and you're going to need to modify the rules of how gravity and matter interact, and that's one way of doing it. Or the rules are fine. What's wrong is that there's matter there that you can't see. It's not visible in any of the wavelengths I've talked about. It simply doesn't give you a signature in light. You don't see it. So here are a couple of images, the ones on the left taken from the Chandra uh, telescope and on the right from Hubble. These are in the X-ray regime. Chandra was an X-ray telescope. Hubble, this is essentially optical. If you look in optical, you can see these strange sort of smeary arc-like features. Now these arc-like features are images of galaxies, or stars, which are behind the galaxy in the foreground. <coughs> and the reason that you're seeing these smeared arcs because the light coming from the distant galaxy or star is being lensed by the gravitational field. The light is being distorted, bent, around the gravitating object in the middle. So instead of seeing a nice point, just like an optical lens out of focus, what you're seeing is a smeared arc of an image that behind it would have been a nice spherical or elliptical galaxy. And we can calculate by looking at different wavelengths just how much mass must be in this galaxy in the foreground. And we know the rules, and we apply them, and therefore we know how much mass would be needed to cause this amount of lensing, this amount of distortion of the image. And again, it doesn't add up. There's mass missing, something that we're not seeing, no matter where we look. The so-called dark matter. Okay. So if our interpretation is correct, if our understanding of gravity is right, and we don't need to change that, if all that's left is the deficit of matter, then what is that dark matter? What is this matter we don't see? Literally dark. We can't see it. It's not luminous. We know how much there should be from all these observations. So if all the matter in the universe that we're aware of constitutes 5% of the total energy matter in the universe, which we think it does, then there's five times as much of this stuff called dark matter out there, sitting around the galaxies, adding to their mass, but not visible to us. And presumably around us now but not visible to us. Now, this much larger, what might look like <laughs> the uh, more exciting immediate uh, portion of this pie chart, the 72%, surely a much larger fraction, the dark energy, uh, I decline to put into this talk because it goes beyond, beyond um, my mandate. But I would just mention, because it's here and because it's so obvious, that essentially the observation is that the universe around us is expanding. This is not new news but that the rate at which it's expanding appears to be accelerating, which is quite new news. If that is true, if the universe is actually expanding at an accelerating rate, there needs to be some force that's driving that increase in expansion. 
that force, the thing behind that force is this so-called dark energy. Okay. However, that's all that I'm going to talk about that particular subject in this talk. We're just going to concentrate here on this 28%, what we can see and what we can't, and it's matter, something that we should be able to understand. So it's light and dark. That was the light and the dark. I come back to light, and I start with something that's perhaps not a very propitious start. Back in 1951, a certain professor, Albert Einstein, opined that all the 50 years of conscious brooding have brought me no closer to answer the question, what are light quanta? Of course, today, every rascal thinks he knows the answer, but he is deluding himself. Well, today, in 2012, I know quite a lot of rascals who believe that they understand light quanta. I probably would include myself amongst them. Um, however, however, I look at this and tremble a little and think perhaps I do delude myself. Uh, if we go back a century before Einstein, we go to back to the time of James Clerk Maxwell, it was a time when the empirical laws of electricity and magnetism were being put together in a single framework. And something very remarkable happened, something that Einstein and I would both agree was remarkable. There's the maths, but let's take that away. Essentially, by taking all that we knew about electricity and all that we knew about magnetism and combining it together in a single framework, a single model, came up with a very remarkable prediction. It turns out that if you have an electric field that changes with time, you can induce a magnetic field. And if you have a magnetic field and it changes with time, you can induce an electric field. And this may suggest sort of a recursive idea, electricity giving magnetism, giving electricity, giving magnetism, and so on. And indeed, it, it turns out that a solution to these equations, a solution to this model, an allowed solution is a wave, a wave-like motion, essentially a bootstrapping where an electric field produces a magnetic field, produces an electric field, produces a magnetic field, and steps its way through space. And more than that, the model predicts very clearly what the speed of that propagation of that wave through space should be, and it should be about 300 million meters per second. Well, it turns out that 300 million meters per second, there is a wave traveling all around us, and we're very aware of it, and it's light. Essentially, if we had not been aware of light, for Maxwell, we could have induced its existence. Light, then, is a wave, and it's an electro electromagnetic wave. It is intrinsically electric and magnetic in nature. Okay. So waves, if you think of waves on a string, or waves on the sea, most familiar with this idea of probably of traveling waves, where if you take the end of a string and you shake it, motion propagates along the string. That's what we're seeing there, a traveling wave. So in our case of light, then this thing is not a distortion of a string, but high electric field, no electric field, negative electric field. And when the electric field is small, the magnetic field would be large. And when the magnetic field is large, the electric field would be small. If we imagine we take one of those waves and we put it in a box, and we make that box of mirrors, a traveling wave travels through the box, hits the mirror, it's a perfect mirror, it reflects back. The result is somehow perhaps unexpected. It's this blue line, a so-called standing wave. It's a trapped wave, a wave in a box. It can't get out. So the electric field is going up and down, up and down inside the box. Shouldn't be unexpected, because of course it's how all stringed instruments work, so how all wind instruments work. Standing waves, resonances of waves inside boxes or on piano strings. So we have travelling waves, which are free to propagate in space. We have standing waves, which are stuck inside a box. At the edges of the box, instead of perfect mirror, no such thing really. More likely, something more like this is happening, that the wave is hitting the edge of the mirror, and it's an electric field, and the mirror substance, the mirror material, is made up of atoms, and the atoms have electrons in them, and the electrons respond to this electric field by moving around responding to the electric field, trying to damp it down. So as the, as the field tries to go into the material, it ends up being damped, damped, and damped, and damped, down, and down, and down, exponentially down. So some of it will be dissipated, and some of it will be reflected back. So we've had travelling waves, standing waves. These things are called evanescent waves, waves which damp down very quickly. I just want to tie us back to the idea of how light and electric charge are intrinsically related. This is a simulation 
The blue lines are electric field lines. The little pink dot here is a charged particle. This yellow line is the trajectory that the charged particle has gone on. So you can see there's a small wiggle up and down, up and down. Maybe because we put magnets up, down, up, down, up, down, forcing this particle to go up and down in its motion. And what you can see is that the electric fields become very intense here in front. Now, what you would actually observe is that you would get a lot of light, a lot of photons, a lot of packets of light being emitted in this forward direction in front of the charged particle. And this sort of brings, brings home that light is in some way the messenger for electric charge. It tells everything else in the universe what an electric charge is doing. Whenever you accelerate an electric charge, it will radiate light. This particular idea is, is used. It's used in machines called synchrotron light sources, for example, where you pass a charged particle beam between magnets to get these curved paths. If you generate light called synchrotron radiation, and you use that to do things like image materials, image chemicals, image biological samples. So light is a wave, and we can imagine maybe taking this step that, that Einstein was perhaps reluctant to, that if we could count the number of total oscillations in this electromagnetic field that presumably is everywhere around us, that each one of those individually would be this quanta, what we call a photon, a packet of light. OK, now I'll ask you to take a bigger step. We've said that light can be thought of as a wave. It turns out that matter has a wave-like nature as well. I don't want to go into that in great de detail, but perhaps it just helps to remind ourselves that we've already seen that if you have some sort of box-type structure, you can localise your wave. You can make your wave trap in, a, in some region. So here's an example of a particular kind of trap, and here's a wave inside it. Here it is decreasing in this evanescent way on the outside, getting small, and inside it's a bit like a standing wave trapped inside. So it can act a little bit like matter then, because we are used to matter being you know, a sort of trapped, localised thing, a solid thing. Maybe. It's just a suggestion. Just worth, I just want to take away from this very quickly. If we look at the energy of something, and we look at the momentum of something, things that we can measure about anything, about whether that be light, or other things, it turns out that no matter what we do and how we play around, energy and momentum are always conserved. Okay? So there are different rules depending on whether I'm a particle with a lot of mass, in which case if I have this amount of energy, I'd have that amount of momentum. Or if I was a photon which has no mass, then I, if I had that amount of energy, I'd have that amount of momentum. There are different rules depending on whether I'm a massless photon or something else. There are different rules. But these overall rules, the energy is conserved, the momentum is conserved, these are solid, these are well observed, these are understood. Okay. That's a little bit heavy, so I turn to a comedic spider and a different image. And a different image. One that I've found helpful and perhaps might, might be useful to other people. So let's imagine, and I hope there are no arachnophobes in the audience, this was my, my real fear about showing this slide. Um, I apologise, there are no real spiders in, shown in this, in this talk. <laughs> Imagine, if you would, uh, because I think it would be useful, that the whole universe around us is permeated essentially by, by cobwebs, each cobweb representing a field, just in the same way that we talk about electric and magnetic fields. But let's consider that those fields could be matter fields, where a, a vibration of the matter field would represent a particle, or they could be like the photon, things that we call gauge fields, but essentially photon-like fields, where an oscillation could be something like a light wave. So let's imagine that these are two strands of the, that cobweb, the cobweb that represents matter. So let's say, let's pick, a, let's pick a particular particle, something with a particular mass that's well known. So let's pick electrons, so electrons being the thing on the outermost area of, of an atom that are responsible for the chemistry of an atom. So let's pick electrons, because they're fairly well known, and say, OK, there is a field that permeates all the space, always. If there's an oscillation in that field, we're going to call that an electron. And here's one of them, let's say. And here's an oscillation in another part of this web. It's another electron. The problem is that if 
these two electrons meet, they have no way of exchanging energy and momentum. They're just going to pass through each other. They won't see each other in this model. We need some way that energy and momentum in one electron can be passed off to another one, because that's what happens. That's what happens when I try and take the electrons in my hand and I put them down onto a solid surface and I feel resistance. I'm feeling the electrons somehow communicating with each other, letting them know there's an electron here, it's charged, they're both charged, they can't get close. Something has to be sending that information, something has to be providing this route between the two, this information exchange. Well, we introduce another cobweb, and that cobweb is going to be, in this case, the cobweb representing light. Because we've already said that electric charge and light are intrinsically linked. So the way that these oscillations will exchange information, exchange energy, exchange momentum, is by an oscillation here in our black cobweb becoming an oscillation in the red cobweb, propagate, 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 and then perhaps joining on with this black cobweb over here, joining two parts of the same cobweb. That's a way in which energy and momentum can be exchanged between these two uh, electrons. So just to remind you, though, these two strands are just part of one great big cobweb here, and we could just think of the path between them as just being a single strand of, of our photon cobweb. I could show them on top of each other, but then you really wouldn't see what was going on. So, as is fairly true in November, everywhere around us is permeated by cobwebs. <laughs> oscillations on some of those cobwebs are matter. Oscillations on other cobwebs are the exchange particles between the matter that are mediating the forces, which are allowing the information about forces to go from one thing to another, allowing energy to flow, allowing momentum to flow. The same amount of energy and momentum always, but in different forms, different vibrations on different cobwebs. Enter the crack. We have a model of all the known particles in particle physics, the standard model. Let's imagine that this cobweb represents all of those matter fields, all of those fields for all the forces that we know about. Now let's introduce another one. Some other field that's going to allow us to take energy and momentum away from all the fields we know about and take them away somewhere else. Possibly taking them to a cobweb we didn't know anything about, but was there all the time. How could it be that we would overlook this other possibility for so long and after so many years of testing, looking at great precision at all kinds of interactions. Well, as long as the coupling between these cobwebs is tenuous enough, weak enough, as long as in order to excite, to generate an oscillation inside this cobweb, it takes a lot of energy, as long as either of those two things is true, it could still be the case that there's a whole lot of these cobwebs, these fields out there that we're not aware of. And if that is true, then potentially energy momentum from all the fields that we know about could flow, <coughs> could flow away into these other fields. And if it did, it would be almost as if it had vanished for a while from all the fields that we know about, perhaps to come back later. That's the crack. OK. Lots of coloured cobwebs. So a particular example. Here's all of our matter fields, everything that represents the electrons that make us up, the protons that make us up, the neutrons that make us up. Coupling to the electric charge, telling us about the electric charge, the messenger for the electric charge, this photon field, where energy and momentum can flow from anything that's electrically charged, into the photon field, taking energy and momentum with it. Let's imagine that the universe has chosen to make a copy of that, a copy of that gauge field, which I coloured purple. Why would it do that? Well, a question probably to ask is why shouldn't it? Because the general rule of thumb is that if the universe can do something, it will. So there are lots of theories, it turns out, so-called grand unified theories that try and unite everything we know about particle physics with everything we know about gravity in one big framework. And in many such theories, you get predictions of such extra copies of the photon 
things which are very much like the photon, but don't couple to electric charge. But apart from that, are very, very similar. Also, potentially, they could have mass, unlike the photon. If that was true, then potentially these two fields can couple together. They can get entangled and mixed together. So that if we send out some energy and momentum from a matter field into our regular everyday photon, our oscillation of light, then perhaps some of that could then flow into this new field, so-called hidden sector photon, and then back again, and then back again. And those of you who are here for the first of these lectures, we'll see something very familiar, because this is exactly the same mechanism as we talked about with neutrinos, when neutrinos change flavor. Those of you who weren't here will wonder what I'm talking about, but some of you were here for that talk. And mem remember that when we're in this, when energy and momentum are in this field, the hidden field, this field doesn't see electric charge, which means that if I have an excitation of this web, an oscillation of this web, it won't see regular matter at all. Because the only thing which gives us substance, which gives us solid ground, which allows us to make air molecules vibrate, which allows for air molecules to exist at all, the only thing that's there is the electric force, the electromagnetic force, that's binding them together, mediating their interactions. For a very, very large extent, we are electromagnetic animals living in an electromagnetic world. And if there was something out there which didn't see electromagnetism, then we wouldn't see it. So it could go through our walls, it wouldn't see them. OK. Now I take one more step into the absurd, <coughs> following Alice. This is a slightly esoteric argument. It discusses something called a neutron. And a neutron is one of the constituents of atoms. This is my model neutron. The neutron is made up of quarks. You can see two inside here, there'd really be three. Bound together by things called gluons, where you can sort of see some glitter in here. That's my gluons. Okay. Okay. So then this is a neutron a member <laughs> of the uh, family of particles that lives inside the nucleus of the atoms that make us up. The constituents of the neutron are electrically charged. They're called quarks. So it's a valid question to ask, how is that electric charge distributed inside this neutron? It has three quarks in it. I've only got two in here, but there are three. So could it be the case that one side of the neutron is more positively charged than the other. Well, there doesn't seem to be a reason why it couldn't be the case. So if that was true, I've shown that by little charge separation here. Imagine that's positive charge and that's negative charge there, electric charge. They're separated a little bit. Okay. And if that were true, then we'd have something called an electric moment, essentially, this yellow line, essentially just telling you that you have a separation of charge. That's all it means. Imagine also that the electric charge inside the neutron could be moving. It doesn't have to be static, it could be moving around. OK, if it was moving around, perhaps it could be like the molten core beneath us now, the molten core of the Earth circulating around, and by its circulation, generating the magnetic field of the Earth, the North Pole, South Pole. Well, that's that purple line there, a North Pole and a South Pole, because of some current flowing around. And now we do a physicist's trick. We ask the question, would all the properties of this neutron be the same? Would it act in the same way if we were to reflect our neutron in a funny kind of mirror? Just as Alice found in going through the looking glass, not a conventional mirror that literally reflects something, but something which distorts, distorts and changes the nature of our in this case, neutron, into something else. So the first thing we could consider is, what if we said it's completely arbitrary whether we call positive charge positive or negative? As long as we're always consistent, it's just a choice. So let's imagine that we call positive negative and negative positive. Well, we could do that. It's 
access to convention, we could just change the convention. And if we did that, essentially, you've done that, in effect. If you had a separation of charge that was one way, it's now gone the other way. And our arrows now point the other way around. That seems fairly fair. And perhaps we would predict that this neutron would behave just like this neutron, because all that's happened, nothing's happened to the neutron, we've just decided to label positive, negative, and negative, positive. That doesn't sound too harmful. Now let's try a slightly more convoluted distorting mirror and say, why should the universe care if we're right-handed or left-handed? Why should it care that a clock goes clockwise and not anti-clockwise? That also seems like an arbitrary decision. So we'll take our right-handed basis to describe the world, and we'll turn it into a left-handed one. We'll basically say the universe doesn't care whether we're right-handed or left-handed. And in general, we're wrong. In general, the universe does care about handedness. It does care about right-handed and left-handed, and it reacts differently to something which has right-handedness to something which is left-handedness. This is not a personal commentary on anyone who's left-handed. <laughs> <coughs> but at a fundamental level, the universe cares. And so what you would do end up doing, it turns out, is that your magnetic moment, your north-south pole, would end up being flipped and your electric one wouldn't, if you reflected in these two mirrors. And you can say, OK, so would we expect this system and this system to behave in the same way? Well, actually, no. Because of this fact that the universe does care about handedness, we wouldn't. There's a physical difference here. We started off in a situation where these things were parallel. Now they're anti-parallel. That's physically different. These systems will behave physically differently. And here's the remarkable thing. Despite the fact that there's no reason why these two things shouldn't exist and behave differently, the neutron has chosen, for reasons we do not understand, to think that this is a problem, to think that it wants this to behave like this. It doesn't want there to be a difference at all. And the only way around that problem is to take away the yellow arrow, to make there be no charge separation. There is no electric dipole moment in a neutron, and there's no reason why there shouldn't be. There's plenty of places in nature, at the fundamental level, where uh, these, this, this contradiction exists where we have two things that go through this transformation and they behave differently. In this case, with a the neutron, they don't. They don't because the neutron has chosen not to have a charge separation, not to have an electric dipole moment. Why has it chosen to do that? How has it chosen to do that? Just how sure are we that it has chosen? Well, this is a measure of the electric dipole moment. It's a distance multiplied by a charge. The charge is just the charge of an electron. So... Imagine that that's an electron charge and that's an electron charge. How far apart would they have to be in order that we wouldn't be able to tell that they were indeed apart at all? Well, we've tested down to this level. So that's 10 to the minus 31, which means 0 point and then 30 more zeros centimetres. One, so one, there's one at the end of the zeros. So we're pretty sure that if there is an electric dipole moment of a neutron, it's very, very small. This is a conundrum. It's called the CP, pro um, uh, the, 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 the strong CP problem. It turns out <coughs> that with the favorite particle physics solution, we like this one, we'll introduce another field to explain it. <laughs> so we do that, and it turns out that if we introduce this other field, we can solve this problem. We can, we can put a natural explanation, an explanation where we introduce another term to the equations, to cancel out the first term, and this, this, this dipole moment disappears naturally. But at, at a price, and it's always with a price, and the price is that we have to have another particle. The new particle is called an axion. So there's a problem, we have a solution. We don't know if it's the right solution, but if it is, there has to be a particle associated with it it's called the axion. It's just like the Higgs mechanism for those who were here for the Higgs lecture. There was a problem. We didn't know how to give things mass. We had a solution. We'd introduce a field. There was a price to pay, a new particle, the Higgs boson. As it turns out, it was a good price to pay because we think we may have found it. The axion, we haven't found. Not yet. <coughs> okay. All right. So that's fairly heavy. I'm going to break things up by having a magic trick. Um, so here is some, um, a great expense, a, an, an eBay 
Chinese magic box, to complete with uh, esoteric Chinese characters. I'm not quite sure which ones they are. Um, so what I need is, is people to, I'll come down here briefly, just to, to tell me that this is an empty box. This is an empty box for the purposes of this stage magic trick, which is a conjuring stage magic, magic trick. This is empty for that purpose. For that purpose, it is empty. Okay. <laughs> Bearing in mind that this is not actually a stage magic act, it is an empty box. Okay. Now, the magic trick that we want to do is that we wish to take a beam of light, shine it at our magic box for some time. We can put ultraviolet light, or visible light, laser light. We'll shine, it, shine light on our box. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay. <laughs> and we have a stuffed beaver. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll put it there. Okay. <coughs> it's meant to be a comedy magic trick, but but it it is the experiment we want to do. It's exactly the experiment we want to do. We want to take an empty box, a genuinely empty box, I'm not giving too much away here, I hope, a genuinely empty box. <laughs> <laughs> genuinely empty box. And we want to shine light at it. And using, using the crack, using the fact that energy and momentum in one field can flow into another, a field that we don't know about yet, the energy and momentum can flow through the box. And once inside, there's some probability it will flow back again into the fields we can measure, and we'll see it. We'll see it as light, not as beavers, as light. <laughs> and we've got two candidates now for this hidden field, for this dark field, for this field that we cannot easily see. One's the first one I introduced, hidden sector photons, something that's just like the photon, just like it, but doesn't have the same constraints. It doesn't have to couple to electric charge anymore. It doesn't have to be massless anymore. It could mix with the photon. So a photon could become a hidden sector photon, could become a photon, and so on. Or it could be an axion. An axion is much more like the Higgs boson, something that we're much less familiar with. It couples essentially to all the matter fields in the standard model. It couples to electrons and to muons. It couples to quarks. It couples to all these things. It too could have mass and indeed has to have mass. It turns out that in order to see an axion, in order to change a photon of light into an axion, we would have to put it through a magnetic field. This comes out of a much more detailed analysis than I can do here. But this is the case, that if we had a photon and it travelled through a strong magnetic field, there's some chance the energy and momentum in this photon, this oscillation of light, could pass into this axion field and become an axion. And then again, if it went through another magnetic field, potentially it could change back. That's what we want to do. That's my, my conjuring trick. Let's light shining through a wall. And that's how we're going to do it. And there's three places that we look. Because there's three sources of these so-called weakly interacting sub-EV particles, these dark particles that we're talking about. One's the sun. Because the sun produces a lot of light and it has a magnetic field the conditions that we need potentially for producing axions and more than we need for producing hidden sector photons because we don't even need the magnetic field for those. So here's the Sun and here's CERN and this is the cast experiment at CERN. So at CERN you'll be aware that they had the Large Hadron Collider, a large collider 27 kilometers in circumference colliding protons with other protons. In order to bend those beams of protons in a circle they used large magnets, dipole magnets what they're called. One such magnet never made it into the LHC and is being used for this experiment. It's a spare. Essentially, this is a telescope with its lens cap left on. And it's looking at the sun. And around it, it's a large magnet. And what we assume is this, that if there are axions, if they exist, then photons from the sun, of which there are a lot, will pass through the magnetic field in the sun, which varies in strength but can be very high. And there's some chance, some probability, therefore, that we'll produce axions, a great beam of axions coming from the sun. So not 
only are there, is there light coming from the sun, not only are the neutrinos coming from the sun, but potentially also there are axions. And if they passed into this telescope, it's essentially a tube, just an empty tube with a magnet around it and detectors in it to detect x-rays, there's some chance the axion would go through the magnetic field, the energy momentum would flow out of the axion field because of the magnetic field and into light, into the light field. And it, if it did so, it turns out that they would be x-rays in this case. And they would be looking for x-rays. And they're looking. And they're looking now. There's another experiment in America called ADMX. In this case, I think it's a dark matter experiment, but I'm not entirely sure. It's looking for axions which come from quite a different source. It's looking for axions which come galactically, axions that were produced in the initial early days of the universe, or the early moments of the universe. If axions exist during the formation of the universe, much energy and momentum must have flown into the axion field. It has to have done so. There's no way around it. If we actually work through the maths, it has to go there. So there must be axions all around us in that case, produced in the initial uh, Big Bang, the initial uh, generation of the universe. We can take a microwave, not an oven, but a box. A box which is about that size, about a microwave size, and we can have a strong magnetic field in it. And these axions, if they exist, and they're converted by a magnetic field, they won't turn into x-rays, they'll turn into microwaves, as in an electromagnetic wave which has a wavelength which is perhaps a few centimetres or more, not very large, as indeed happens in your domestic microwave at home. When you turn your microwave on, you have microwaves with wavelengths of a few centimetres going throughout your microwave. The actual experiment looks more like this, and it's much more complicated, but it has a metal box in which microwaves can oscillate around. They'll hit the metal surfaces and reflect back. We'll get this standing wave idea that we had way back at the beginning of the talk. There's a big magnet around it. It's cooled down to very, very low temperatures, which was discussed in last week's uh, talk, making waves talk. And one of the reasons for that is because the magnets need those low temperatures. And another reason is that there's thermal vibration all around us all the time, noise, things oscillating around. And if you're looking for something that's incredibly hard to detect, you need to shield it from the outside world. You're looking for something which, if there was only a slight vibration, it would be washed out. You wouldn't see it. Go down to the lowest temperatures you can. You go down to the lowest temperatures you can to avoid those thermal vibrations and to make it as easy as possible to detect these signals. And that's what's going on in this experiment. So they've taken their microwave, they've put it in the freezer, they've put a large magnet on it, and now they're waiting and making measurements. Okay. This is a complicated plot. I say that first because it's a complicated plot and you'll look at it and think it is. We, go, we can take away from it a couple of very simple things though. If there are axions, they have to have some mass. Always the same mass. That's what it means to be a particle. Things are always having the same mass. So mass of the axion. Here would be very, very high masses. Down here, very, very low masses. In order for us to detect it, there has to be some chance that an axion can become a photon, can become an axion. That's coupling, the, the likelihood that that will happen, the probability that that will happen, the strength of the coupling, is on here. So up this end here, it's very, very likely that an axion will become a photon, or a photon will become an axion, and down here it's extremely unlikely. So up in that corner over there, we have very massive axions that couple to photons a lot. If that was true, we really should have seen them. And it's also the realm of traditional particle physics experiments, things with a lot of mass. You generally need particle colliders to generate. And these coloured regions are regions where we have looked and excluded the possibility of there being such an axion. We've already looked, we've measured it. Everywhere that's coloured, we've looked. The only regions left are these white ones. The experiments we just talked about, that's the one at CERN there, CAST. They took away all of that region by looking. Turns out there weren't any axions with those parameters. ADMX, well, this very thin, narrow piece here, corresponding to the wavelengths of the microwaves in their microwave box. They've excluded that down to very, very low couplings down here, low masses. So, so we have reverse those labels in your mind, would you? 
that's the mass, and that's the coupling. Reverse those labels in your mind. That's very massive, that's not massive, that's a hard, large coupling, that's a small coupling. I apologize for that. It doesn't take away the fact that you can see that there's regions where we've looked and there's regions where we haven't. This is for axions. This one is labeled correctly, mass along here, <laughs> coupling along here. This is hidden sector photons. Don't need a magnetic field for those. Slightly different constraints. There's a few regions here in sort of a light browny color. That's not regions where we've looked. That's regions where we have reason to believe that if there were such things, they would do extra stuff for us. They would explain in a very direct way, perhaps, some of the dark matter problems that we have. Okay. So there's specific reasons to want to look in those regions. Some places we have, in some cases we haven't yet. All of these regions up here, we've looked in various ways. There are no hidden sector photons there. There are no hidden sector photons that have these masses and these couplings in this region. So for example, these exclusions over here, we've looked by looking at the magnetic field on Jupiter and on Earth. And we've looked at variations in it. And by doing that, we've been able to put constraints and say, well, no, if there were hidden sector photons with these properties, they would have some impact on this field, and we'd have seen it. And we haven't. We can look in this region over here, and we see something called the hidden cosmic microwave background. That sounds rather, rather esoteric. So essentially, this would be a region where we would want to look if... We had, if we believed that part of the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of the Big Bang, if part of that was hidden from us in the hidden sector. Up this end, we have traditional accelerator physics, like the LHC, excluding things with very, very high masses. Here, we have simply measuring how does the attraction between electric charges vary with distance, something we should know. But if there were hidden sector photons, it would be modified, and this would tell us something about it. Many different ways of looking at the same problem. At the moment, at Lancaster and at the Cockcroft Institute, we're building an experiment which will just make it a tiny little incursion here, if all goes well. Our own little spot on this diagram, our own place to look. And who knows, perhaps we got the lucky raffle ticket, and in fact, not an exclusion at all, but we'll actually make a discovery. That would be nice. But it's not our first aim. It's a microwave experiment, and on this plot, microwaves correspond to this sort of region on the plot. So we're looking for microwaves. And it looks like this, essentially. Two cavities in which microwaves can oscillate around and be trapped. Effectively, two boxes like this, and we power one of them. We put microwaves in one. We turn one microwave oven on, microwaves inside. No microwave should come out, because surely there's a good wall here. But if they can oscillate and become hidden sector photons, they could go through into the neighboring microwave, and they could oscillate in here. And if we had a detector here, then we could say for sure whether there was some path, some way, some additional route by which photons can travel from one to the other, a route that hasn't been suspected until now. Now, really, our microwave cavities don't look like ovens. They look more like this. And they're exactly the sort of technology that's used to accelerate particle beams in particle accelerators. It's exactly the same technology, which is why an accelerator institute is involved in doing it. These are essentially metal boxes, precision metal boxes, machined to a very, very high standard in which you can have uh, microwaves oscillating and not dissipating inside these structures. It makes them very, very sensitive. And there's a step that we could potentially go beyond it. I'll just briefly mention, so coming to the end of the talk. It turns out that in nature, now turn to butterflies, we had spiders earlier. If we look at butterfly wings close up, they have a structure that gives them the iridescence. And that structure has a characteristic size, a size which matches the wavelength of the light that you're seeing on the butterfly's wing here. So this color that you're seeing isn't coming from the traditional method of color in pigment, where chemical interaction, essentially, where light is hitting molecules, certain wavelengths are being absorbed, certain ones reflected. It's not coming from that at all. It's coming from the fact that these structures have about the right size to match the wavelength of the light. And there's some interaction going on there between these regularly spaced grid-like pattern here and the light wavelength, such that you see certain frequencies of light and not others. 
This is called photonics. This is a famous example in the nature of it. But imagine that we could build our own artificial photonic structure for microwaves. Well, microwave wavelengths aren't tiny like this. They're centimetres. So you could build an experiment right now in front of you on a, on a table. And it would only be a reasonable size, maybe a metre or two across. And you could have many of these little rods or these little structures on it. So it's hard to see, but on here there's little yellow rods. And then you could put some microwave into it, a little electric oscillation, and they'd be trapped in it, just as they would be trapped inside a metal box. Even though the metal box is not completely sealed, this regular periodic lattice, it turns out, with a hole with one rod missing, turns out to be a way that you can trap electric and magnetic energy in a way. So this is another place that you could look to see how likely is it that electric mag electromagnetic energy that you've trapped, light that you've trapped, can escape and get out and be found somewhere else. So this is an example of a simulation done by one of my PhD students at Lancaster, where we're answer asking the question, if we were to produce a photon in one of these lattices, how likely is it that we would see energy from it in our detector? It's moving towards building an experiment where we can search for these effects. And I think it's kind of nice that we're using these tiny structures inspired by nature uh, to investigate a phenomena where we started to, ask, to answer a question that really only arises when you look out into a universe which is light years in extent. So it's rather nice that the two things pull together. And so with that, essentially, I will close. I hope I've convinced you that there's at least a possibility and a reason to believe that there could be a crack in everything. And just maybe that is how the light gets in. And I think that's a nice comforting thought on a very dark, wintry night in Lancaster. There may be a little bit more light coming in here than we would otherwise think. Thank you very much.